I guess we'll, we will start. So from the beginning, my name is Stefan Gustafsson. I'm a software developer uh, for my own company, but I consult at uh, Electronic Arts at DICE in Stockholm, making Star Wars Battlefront 2 right now. Uh, mostly coding C++ in my day job, but writing tools in C Sharp and PowerShell. And as I said before, I just love the platform. I think it's an, an amazing accomplishment. It has its quirks and it, its uh, ugliness, but in all, it's just wonderful. Uh, so today, we will look at a couple of things, just general, quickly, what is performance, and then we will look at object allocation, which is a fancy word for, say, for saying creating new ob objects. How, do you cr how can you create it? And what, what does the different methods cost? Uh, working with collections like arrays and lists, performance differences, when sh should you choose what? File system, can you do that differently really? Well, it turns out you can if you really have to, and we'll look at the differences. Uh, parameter binding, a lot of people have, have uh, hinted at that here, that parameter binding is the most complex except for the formatting system, uh, part of the, the engine. It's a really complicated piece of, piece of code to get the pipeline to work for you, getting the objects in the pipeline to bind to the parameters of your functions. It's super convenient, and I use it all the time, but it's slow. So to, to look at that and, and figure out when should you use that and when, if you have to, should you opt out of it. We'll take a little bit, little peek at uh, .NET code too to see when you sh should use it if you have to, and maybe some tips and tricks. So performance, uh, think carefully about like, don't optimize prematurely, because part of performance includes uh, writing the code. Uh, if you, if you're just writing something to get it done quickly. A lot of the things that I will talk about here d does not apply to you. It just get it done. Most of the things here is if you have something that will run frequently or have to use, process a larger amount of data, then it may, may be a, an issue. But, but like, don't make it more complicated than you have to. Uh, yes, so these things, like one, one aspect of performance is how much memory you use. How much do you affect the system you're running on? Do you have like external demands that no, you, like you're sharing this machine with people doing other stuff? You can't do use all the CPU on it, or you can't use all the memory on it. That may dictate like the solution we choose. So, creating objects in PowerShell, uh, we have. What, when I say objects. I'm saying create structure in some way. And, and to me, this is what differentiates PowerShell from all of the other shells. We have an ex excellent opportunity to create structure. So I always create structure in the beginning, and then I can pipe and sort and group and, and, and party on the, on the data. But I can't do that unless I have the structure. And for me, structure means both like naming stuff, but also typing stuff. Hash table, hash table is just like a, a named bag of values, right? But it's still st structure, and it's, it's there and it's easy. PS custom object has more structure than a hash table. You can actually specify a type name, and, and it has an order on its properties, and you can extend it with methods. And like, It's more expensive, but you get more for it. We have classes in PowerShell 5, and we have classes in .NET, like writing it in C Sharp. To say the least, performance of these, uh, all objects are not created equal. Uh, so I will run a script here that will measure the creation time. Uh, I will create like a million objects of each, I think. And so here it comes. We're starting with creating a PS class. 
Uh, just using, I have this written in a small class, we'll look at it. Uh, it has just two properties, and I created it first just by like casting a hash table with the names to the class. Uh, the other method, I use a constructor on the class and call the constructor. Turns out that is somewhat slower than, uh, than just casting the hash table. You see the .NET version uh, is um, significantly faster. If we look at the graph of this, uh, you can see the huge, this one. If you look at the top, the blue is how much memory we were using, creating a million objects. Uh, the orange is how many ticks it took, like how many hundred nanoseconds. And looking at this, we can see that .NET kicks ass. So if you really, really need to be fast in PowerShell, like you don't have to do anything fancy at all. Just creating the class in a small piece of C, as a C-sharp string and then add to type it, you can see that, that we are talking two to three order of magnitudes in both uh, memory or one order of magnitude in memory and two order of magnitudes in speed. And th this is not really like this is not something you think about every day, and you notice it when you start to process big amounts of data. I ran into it when I was uh, handling crash dumps for Battlefield, and uh, when you go public beta on a very popular game. Uh, a million players crashing five times a day, and you have a beta for a week. I got some data, and uh, and uh, PS custom object that I was using first just broke down. Like, as you, as you can see, it's, it's consumed too much memory. So, just very quick look at. Uh, This is what it looked like. The string thing is nothing you, you actually had to do, but just have uh, a property. Uh, I had two properties here. I had, I had one version with the constructor and one, one without. The same thing in C Sharp that I, I ran was like this. It's, it's the version with the constructor uh, that was slightly slower. Uh, that's the overhead of a script block invocation. It's not huge, but it's there. This is a trade-off between convenience in code, making the code slightly more elegant, but you actually lose a bit of performance with it. Okay, any questions about that before moving on? Yeah, uh, to understand this, in PowerShell, what we're looking at here is the object layout of the .NET class. Uh, it only references one single other object. Uh, the size of it all, including uh, the, all CLR objects, have an object header. Uh, then there's a string, and there's then there's an integer, and then there's four bytes of padding because it, they all have to end up in, in uh, uh, on an eight bound memory eight byte memory boundary. So you get a uh, size of thirty two of this object. And the PS class needs a way to access access the PowerShell session state. So all the classes have an extra member variable, uh, which is the session state internal that you see. It had the same string, hash table. Hmm. Oh, we have comparers, we have buckets. Uh, a hash table is an array of arrays. And each of those, like, when you find an object in a hash table, you actually calculate an integer from the object you're trying to find. You index into one array to find an array or a list of objects that actually contains this. So there's a lot of structure. It seems 
just like properties, but it isn't. And that's overhead in this case. So an object is much, much leaner. And looking at a PS custom object, the PS object, you have all the like adapters to make them work with the current subsystem they're in. You have uh, collections keeping track of the order of the members and what kinds they are and the type of those and like you have more structure it's easy and convenient but it's sizable and kind of expensive i use it a lot in an everyday scripting when i just need to do something quick so i'm not saying don't use it this is very important i'm just saying when you really need the speed know the difference okay Okay, some looping. Uh, we, we will look at a couple of different options here for each object. Uh, we know it, we love it. For each as a language construct, like for each parenthesis dollar in some collection, do this. We will look at the for each magic method. Hands up, who has heard about the for each magic method? A few of you? I will, will, let's just look at the construct. Uh, and the classic for loop. We will also do this in two ways. One where we pipe things into sum. We have a, a, a function calculating a sum. So it takes a bunch of, of uh, values to ca calculate and it just sums them. Looking at that code, this is the different ways. Like we have a um, Numbers here, an array of integers. Hmm. This is my PowerPoint skills. That I amaze you with. Uh, okay, so the first one here, uh, we pipe numbers into for each object. You should suppose here to see some penalty for using the pipeline and do parameter binding, right? Next, we have the for each language construct. All I do is just add it to, to a sum up here. The magic for each is actually something that, this isn't like a real method. So what's happened is when PowerShell tries to figure out what method to call, in the binder, when it doesn't find anything else, and they see that the object that we're doing this on is I enumerable. It implements the interface I enumerable. Then, it like redirects this to an internal call to for each or where on a collection, which takes a couple of, couple of other parameters, but you can call it just with a script block, but you can also call it in a, diff a few other ways. And it's faster than uh, the pipeline version. You will get the dollar underbar within it, so it's very similar in usage but you pay a memory penalty. So it's a trade-off between memory because you will do this all in memory. You will not get the streaming. Classic performance trade-off between memory and speed. And depending on your, your needs, you will do one of the others. And then we have the, the final, the number version here. Or, sorry, the four version in the end. So just uh, running this. That was, oh, I missed one thing. What was happening here in the beginning was we're running it, passing it, the array of numbers to sum as a, one parameter, and the other version was when we piped it in. So when I passed it as, as an array, that's the orange times. Blue is piping it. You can see we have a shootout here between uh, for each, the language version and the for loop. Both are substantially faster. But they are a little bit less convenient and a little bit more syntax heavy. It's so easy to just have a variable and, and type dot for each, print, um, curlies, and go party on it. So I, I use that a lot too. But it's only when I end up with like 
often we're, we're talking times that are so small that it's not noticeable. So here I've chosen iteration counts to actually make it expensive enough to, to be worth showing. So here I had 100,000 iterations. But you can see that piping to for each is still expensive. So uh, this is one of the things to take with you. When you, have, when you build your functions, make sure that if you're processing a lot of data, make one of, of them, like, make them take array input. You can add like parameter value from pipeline or value from pipeline by property name too. And in, if we look at this, some function that, that I, so measure sum here. Oh, I didn't even, yeah, I get, this is uh, one version where I pass it as an array, right? And in the pipeline, I create it and pipe it into it. So I can use it in both ways. But make sure that you provide the version that actually takes the array input so you can opt out of the pipeline. Hands up, those of you who understood what I said here. Wow, well, it's fairly okay. No, this is important enough to actually iterate. Let, let's find this get sum. Here, this thing. I, I have value from pipeline, so I can pipe in the integers. But I also have it As an, like, I have the array notation, so I can just pass it in a single call. The difference is that process here will be called once for each item in the pipeline. And if I pipe 100,000 items, it will be called 100,000 times. If I pass it as an array, it will be called once. Okay? And that matters. The pipeline is convenient, extremely convenient. And I use it all the time, but know when to not use it. Okay, so file system IO, what I'm going to do is just iterate through the Windows um, system 32 directory and enumerate all the files. So I'm just interested in, in getting the names. And I will, did you know that uh, get command line, uh, get uh, child item has a parameter dash name to only get the name? So that's great, like doing less work in, instead of getting everything. So we'll try that. And we will try, try the get child item without the dash name property. We will use uh, the dot net uh, directory class and use enumerate files and then we will pull out the big guns and do native interop calling uh, the win32 version of find files directly this time using a flag that they don't use in dotnet framework saying that you should use a large buffer when you enumerate files this doesn't like I have a fast SSD on my laptop it's not a huge deal here, but it is a huge deal if you enumerate network shares. Then it's a, a very big deal. So it's a, a bad demo here, but you will, we will still look at the difference. So. We will do it again then. I have, yeah, I have to quit some demo mode before I can, or let's shoot. So, chai light the name first, oh, that was fast. 
but you can still see the difference here. We have, somewhat surprisingly for me, it's twice as slow to just get the name as to get everything. No, uh, no, it's actually uh, the, the provider interface uh, that is that get child item command that is, is using has actually a get provider item name method. And I, and I actually sat down last night and tried to figure out like what, why is it so much slower? But uh, I had to reinstall my laptop so I can't get the, I can't get the, the PowerShell project to build because I haven't installed Visual Studio 25, uh, 2015 which you, you have to, so, so I, I, I don't understand why it's uh, more expensive. It shouldn't be, but it definitely is. That said, it's using the .NET method underneath to do the enumeration. So it's not surprising that the .NET enumeration is faster because it does less work. And just to show that if you're really, really, uh, if you really care about this, you can actually squeeze out, well, what do we have, a factor of five up to get child item. And, and this is code that, that uh, I borrowed from a guy on, on the code project and, and modified some. Uh, this, you don't have to understand the things to use it. Uh, especially if it's in production. But you can see there's, there's quite a lot of code. Uh, uh, and just this is like the beef of it, where we actually say in kernel 32, use find first file, and you can't even get use like the normal version. You have to get the EX version, which provides extra parameters for fiddling with stuff. And that has a flag, and if you pass, if you want a large buffer there, you can pass two instead of one. And that made the difference between the two versions of the .NET enumerations that you saw. So this is actually something we should push to fix in, in .NET proper, and then, pro and then or .NET Core, and then PowerShell would benefit from it. But you can see just small things of, or doing things differently can have a quite significant significant performance impact. You know what? You will. S I don't switch over to the presentation mode. You will see it like this, right? So we we will look at. Did, did you know about the ps commandlet variable? when you write advanced functions. So if you tack on uh, the command binding attributes to your param section on a function, or if you have a parameter attribute on any of the parameters, PowerShell will make sure that you have a variable uh, called $PS commandlet. And this is the same object that you as a C-sharp developer inherits from and you get access to the same method as when you're writing C-sharp. So if you pr program C-sharp and want to write output, you call commandlet.writeObject. And you call uh, like write progress, write error, write... So these methods are, are all on, on the... Can you turn that off in some way? Uh, so you can, you can use write object, uh, the function, you can use the commandlet, uh, write output. Both of these have a version uh, like where you say no enumerate. Have you heard about that? So if you have a big collection and you want to write it to the pipeline, you can either like loop over it and call, make a call by call by call and say write object, or you can call it and say that's no enumerate. And that array will go as one object into the pipeline. So you can pass a huge amount of data as one object to the pipeline instead of enumerating it all. And this is really nifty. I sometimes, when I work with commandlets that handle a large amount of data, provide an as array parameter 
for output, saying that in this case, I just want the object. I don't want you to enumerate them all and me to add them again to new collection. <laughs> okay. Looking at how this uh, differs in performance, we see that write output uh, We should have a, a larger iteration count here too. To see if that is. You can see that the no enum methods generally are really, really fast because they like doing something once is always faster than doing it a million times. It's obvious, but if you don't know about the methods, uh, yeah, uh, you can't use it. Those, uh, th that says non-captured. That's actually, if you don't say anything, you just slip the, like don't capture the object in a variable and let it pass to the pipeline. That's fast. That's, it's, it's good to know that's a fast pass. So write methods on the commandlet or in the advanced function, the, D, the $PS commandlet, it's more useful for like the write progress and write, uh, write error, the other streams. It, it's quite a bit faster, but for like not doing anything is so fast, so I wouldn't bother with it for output. Did you follow me? Okay. Member access, calling methods on stuff. So we will look here at member access and do this in, is it too small? So we're doing this in a couple of, of different ways. Uh, to date time, I add a method add fortnight, add 14 days. I do this as a code method, as a script method, uh, as a .NET call directly, and as a call to PowerShell class. Just to, like four different ways of doing this. Hands up those of you have, who have heard of uh, code methods or script methods. Few of you. It's part of the extended type system where you can actually say update type data. Use this uh, method and tack it on to the object. And when you call that, uh, you, you can like add properties and methods onto existing objects. So this is what I've done with date time. Date time now has a new object and we call it in, in those different ways. This is how you can like programmatically do this and add update type data. It's faster if you have to extend many uh, objects at the same time. This is just code to show how you, it can be done. You can also use the update type data command that was, which is easier to use. What surprised me here is actually how fast the code method was. The code method, I've written a little, little piece of code in, in uh, C Sharp. It just looks like this. On date time, I create a static method that takes a piece object. And if this is the date time, I add 14 days and return it. Okay? And by using the uh, update type data and add this, this uh, code method to it, I can use it on, on date time. And look at this, like, uh, this is actually, uh, when you do measurements like this, it's not faster than the .NET method. It does more work than it. But what can happen when you measure 
things like so imprecise that I do here, uh, you will end up with uh, things like, oh, a garbage collection happened here, or the system was doing something else. So should we run this again, you would see the opposite, that the code method is it's actually slightly more expensive than the .NET method. Functions are quite a lot more expensive. That's a PowerShell function. I just wrote a function add and, and call that. Class methods, strangely, also quite a lot more expensive. I, I had expected that to be more expensive than the script method, but the invocation is obviously cheaper here. This is something that often comes up for me. I have incorrect expectations. I have some belief that this is fast and this isn't. This should be fast. Oh, it's a class. It should be. And, and quite a lot of times I end up, oh, really? So measure. Uh, it's always, always, always uh, like most of the time I'm wrong with my performance assumptions. Well, then when we're, uh, yeah, let's looking at like some various things. Collections, what's that? So, uh, was anybody at the talk uh, yesterday on performance where they showed array list ver versus array? So, what I will do here is uh, add numbers to an array. I will do this in three different ways and contrast them. So, one is, is uh, just a PowerShell array. Okay. Next is using an array list. And the third is using the generic system collections, generic list of T. This is not the same as like a cup of T, but, uh, okay, hands up uh, those who, who have heard the word generics. Few, so, okay. Uh, generics is a way to program once, but saying that this variable is actually a type that I will instantiate this collection with. So I can create a list of int that only can contain integers. An array list has objects as its storage. Objects can be anything. So what I'm basically doing here is specializing a collection to only handle one particular kind of object. And since you have done the specialization, you can do it faster especially if you're using primitive types or in .NET structs, which are, do you know the difference between a struct and a class in .NET? So it's, it's basically, if you, if you have a struct, that is always used at the place on the stack where you currently are. When you have an, an object, it's allocated on the garbage collected heap, and on the stack you have a reference to it. That's a reference type is a class. So a struct is called a value type and an object is a reference type. So when you're adding an integer to an array list or a PowerShell array, it actually has create an object that it puts the integer in and add that reference to the array list. But when you're creating a list of integers, it actually inlines. So instead of having an array of objects that points to integers, you have just an array of integers stacked onto each other in memory. And this, uh, on modern processors, blazing through an array of linear memory is so amazingly fast, so you can't believe it. But as soon as, as you have to start hitting different pieces of memory, like finding an address and looking that up, you get into cache lines effects on the processor. Have you heard about this? So it, one of the strange side effects that is really counterintuitive is that it may be much faster to just blaze through an array and find, just look at each item and find them, then go through a dictionary and look it up. Just because of this, in a dictionary, well, I have to c c calculate a hash, I have to find that index in memory, I have to th go through another list and finally go back to the object. So if you hit 
cold cache lines and have to bring this in from, from main memory, that may very well be more expensive than, than, than just doing a lot more of work. It's counterintuitive and it's definitely not, it wasn't that way when I was in school. This is something that's changed uh, and it's, it's because the ratio between the development of processors and memory speed has been much faster on the processors than on memory. So we can now do a lot more work and throw it away. Like recalculating may be much faster than caching it. It's, it's weird, but, but it's unfortunately true because it's much harder to reason about. A lot of talk, a uh, little action. Uh, so what's happening here, uh, we're looping through this and doing it for different iteration counts. So for uh, 5,000 uh, items, we add them to the array and then we do it to the array list and then to the generic specialized list. And uh, you can see some quite substantial differences here between uh, the different versions, uh, like the the ones to the right, we're using so small itera uh, like iteration counts here that we, uh, the differences among them are just noise. Uh, and in the end here, you, you see uh, the, the values I have is 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. And what you see is actually exponential growth for the, for the array. It's a terrible way of doing this. So what's happening is I have an array with one item first. Okay, then I add one. So I have to create a new array of size two, copy the one item over to that array, and then I'm, oh, I'm gonna add a new item. Let's create an array of size three and copy the two items. And for every iteration, I have more and more work to copy. Adding yet another, uh, you, you see, it's an exponential growth, and, and that is something we want to avoid at all costs, yes? No. So, the last column, I actually... Uh, I ran for two million iterations, and I hacked the code saying that if I have more than 30,000 items, don't even bother to do the array, because then we, we would never get home. Ever. Uh, so what you see, the 71 milliseconds, that's just the time to reach over the 2 million items. If, if we... We'll... Yeah, yeah, you, you can take a look. I'm just hopping out. But just to see that when we're running with 2 million elements, we're beginning to see the differences in speed between the 260 milliseconds and the 184 with the generic. So the generic will take less memory and it will be faster. It's not by much, but uh, like since we're, the subtitle was like whenever a millisecond counts, here you have it. If you really want to do your best here, this is the way to do it. To get there, what, what I've done at the top of this, I'm using the namespace system collections generic. This is where I bring a array list in from and diagnostics I'm using for the stopwatch class that I use to time these things. It's a high resolution timer. And somewhere here, here yeah, you can see that if, the, if I have more than 30,000, don't even bother. So the syntax then, this is something that you may not have seen before then. So I'm saying create a list and instantiate it with a type int. I could have said list of string in the same way, and then it could only hold strings. And in this case, like in, if you program in .NET, you get an exception if you try to uh, add something else. In PowerShell, it will try to convert to string, or convert to an int, but, but that, that's the, the way we're living in. Does it make sense to you, this uh, generic list? Okay, cool. Please ask, uh, like, if you're feeling you're not getting it, you're not alone. Was it Jared? Was it you who said about the imposter syndrome? 
Yeah. You have to tell you. <laughs> okay, that was uh, collections. Okay, now we're into the more of the like tips and tricks. This is the magic where method. You remember I said that if you have something innumerable and you can't find anything else that matches, like an object on this. Oh, I got a big gotcha here. List. List of t, list of int, has a for each method. So if you try to use the magic for each method on a list, you will be surprised. Because the binder will find a method. It's not the for, like the magic for each method. No, on list, it's actually, it has a member method for each. And the, the, the link extension method is called select. Uh, um, that's another topic, but, but I'll actually show you an example of using link from PowerShell at the end here. So this for each takes a script block, an enum saying what kind of filtering I want to do, and let's see if I can clear this. And if we just run this. Say get thousand numbers and take the first ten and join them uh, with a comma. Expected? Yeah. And it's a fast way of doing. It. This is what happens. Like when you know you all all have the feelings. You're lay, laying in at bed late at night, right? And you, you've got bored thinking about the divisibility of integral numbers. And you don't like you don't feel for sleeping. And you go up and you read the source code for the binder in PowerShell. And you see this comment saying, here's an optimization. If you don't pass the script block, we will do this optimized. Eh? So without a filter, they are actually taking a very fast path. So to partition, for example, split a big chunk of uh, data into two pieces. Uh, like the, I wanted the first hundred in one and the the rest of them in the next bucket. I will get two variables assigned. It's, it has two outputs, A and B. And if we run this together, you will see that I have partitioned it with 100 in one and 900 in the other. And it's, it's a fast way of doing it. So this is a faster way. You have seen the pipeline uh, select dash last, right? Select object uh, dash last 10. It will give you the last 10 of them. This is a faster way of doing it. And as always, trading memory for speed. Okay, this, the magic for each methods or, or where methods work on a collection in memory. We'll use more memory, but will be faster. So here I got the last 10. And it, this is the way to skip until, like, you know, don't use the first hundred. I will not run uh, the web download demo here, but you can try it at home and see the differences. Uh, we can actually go. Here in. I will just show you like this. You, have you used invoke web request as output file? If you, what I've done here is run it with, with progress. This is with, with progress disabled, uh, and this is without progress disabled. And this is using system.net, uh, the web client class. Quick, we'll take a look at the code. But, but for some stupid reason, they, they have written the most incredibly stupid progress code ever in the invoke web request. So, so it takes like 10 seconds to download a file that downloads in a half a second without progress. But why? 
So I can <laughs> it would be so fast that you wouldn't see how <laughs> it's kind of silly. Uh, last will do uh, string addition when you have to build up a large string. And I will do this in two different ways. You will see the same thing as with array and and uh, the list. So in the, the interesting things here, this was just something I hacked up this morning to, to uh, I'm actually, it's a bad test because I'm doing two things. I'm just, I'm formatting and I'm uh, appending things to a larger string. And I'm doing it in different ways. I have a starting string and I use plus equals, uh, or I use a string builder, or I use a string builder with an initialized size but this is something I did on the collections too that I showed you. I actually said, start with this capacity. Otherwise, they will start with a very small capacity, but they are smart. So when you run out of space on a list and it needs to, to do this reallocation and copying, it makes an array that is usually one and a half times as, as big. And here you will get the exponential growth on the allocation size. So quite fast, you will get up to large sizes and there are just a few copies. But if you know up front that I will not use more than this, you can get, get into a situation where you have no copies. And that's where you want to be. Okay, so just uh, adding a string with a string builder, uh, a string builder with a pre-allocated size and with nothing at all. Hedge your, or what, is, what do they say in English? Ladies and gentlemen, place your bets. Yeah. You see that, like, you see the exponential growth that we expected. And on the bottom here, it's hard to say, but you see, you can see the string builder cap, the red here, I think it's a 16, 160,000, and the one with, uh, with, no, it has 16, and the other has 22. So, like, it's not a huge difference if you don't uh, start with the capacity, it's not, the end of the world, it's still fast. But you can squeeze a little bit of extra performance by, by giving it, a, a, if you know it's going to be large, give it a large chunk to start with. Jared? Yeah, like, uh, if you know exactly, uh, then the array is the way to go. That's the least amount of overhead. A list is when, when you don't know for sure, but if you know the general, uh, the general area or an upper limit, you will get something that, that knows how big it is. Uh, you don't know up front, it's determined by uh, some variable or user input. Uh, but it ha uh, like, but a, l a list is a very good data structure. If you, if you have it and know the size or, or a reasonable size to start with, it's excellent to work with. And the overhead compared to uh, uh, an array are just a few bytes. Now let's see here if I don't have a measure string. Yeah, let's do it only with string builder and string builder cap, but with four million iterations. Yeah, you can see, you can see the, no, the, the, it's almost indistinguishable here. Yeah, 
usually, like when you run this 10 times, uh, the, this, the one with the initialized capacity uh, wins 8 out of 10. Uh, and th this is like, it wins every time, but the m inaccuracies and in measurements uh, messes with us sometimes. This is the usual, uh, not a large difference, but a little bit. It didn't? Yeah. Uh, what will happen is that the list will see that are you trying to add something? Is it at the top of my capacity? Yes. Okay. Allocate a new array. Copy the old one into it. And the new array that you allocated is usually 1.4 or 1.5 times bigger than the old one. But it also has a variable. Uh, like it, it knows its capacity and its current size. So it, it knows like where to end and uh, add the next and how big it is, but it also has some unused uh, array space where you can keep adding until you get to the limit again. But then the next one will be 1.5 as, times as big as this new one. They already want like one, one and a half times bigger one. So, so you will get bigger and bigger chunks every time. Yes? No. Uh, yes. Don't don't go overboard here, but but, but yes. It actually actually has to allocate a new array that is just the size of the content, because an array doesn't have like an, a concept of current current end. But. Then we're again into this things, thing that I was talking on, about before. Linear copying of data is so amazingly fast. So, so the, yet again, an, an effect of the, the cache lines of modern processors and the predictions of the memory systems of the CPUs. So it actually figures out that, oh, you're reading linearly through this. You will probably need this memory in a little while. So let's prefetch that. Let me get that from the, from the RAM through the caches to you. So when you get to it, it will be hot in your cache. Okay. So the last thing we will look at here is, uh, I'll just show you, this is uh, a class or um, Get standard deviation. It's just to get statistics from uh, from uh, a set of, of objects. You want to get like the spread of a number. Uh, to do this, unfortunately today, uh, there is an enumerable. This is system.link.enumerable, which has a method sum that takes something enumerable. Remember what I'm doing here? The, the, the uh, actually, the important thing here is link and not the, the math between standard uh, deviation. So to do this, to call this sum, I have this numbers uh, and I have diff square. Ah, this is the thing I call, it's the method I'm calling. This is ugly. This is what I call. I call numbers and I pass it the diff square method. And to get that method, I actually have to re reflect on it. I have to create a delegate on this, speci specifying the generic type of it. Because this is one of the pieces uh, where PowerShell is kind of half-baked, that we don't have good support for calling generic methods in the .NET framework. Like a generic method is like a generic class, a generic type, where you can like instantiate a new version of, of the method specialized for handling just integers or just strings. And in this case, it takes a function that takes a decimal as input and returns a decimal. But to use link, you get into some fairly 
efficient code using this. Getting into the Dotnet frameworks methods of working with collections. They are faster than calling the, the PowerShell constructs. This, this is just, if you want to look at, into it, please have a look. Uh, we have an issue open on, on the GitHub site for PowerShell that we should add support, that, that we don't have to do this, that we can just... Uh, so I'm trying to get to this method, to call this for each uh, item. But to do this, uh, I have to do this syntax dance of saying, give, find this method on me uh, to call me. And this is the sort of infrastructure that PowerShell normally does for us for calling other methods. It's uh, see it as not yet, not yet implemented. We we will get there, and uh, we are looking into getting support for calling extension methods that, that link is in the in the beginning. Like uh, extension methods, hands up. Extension methods is something that's used very very much in the, the core CLR and the .NET framework, where when you design a class. It has a set of features, but for, for example, if you have your, your data model and you want to be able to convert it to JSON, yeah, should you add that as a member of that class? It really doesn't belong there. This data model is concerned with, with your data. In two weeks, somebody will come up and, well, I actually want to convert it to XML too, and JAML, and, and Protobuf, and you name it. So what you can do then in .NET, in .NET is create, I actually have this in, as an example how it looks, when you, when you write it like this, I have a public static method called word count, which has a keyword this first, and then it takes the type that, is, that it is extending, and it does something with it. This will show up when you code, uh, you can use it just as if it was a member of the method. So it's a, a way of separating concerns. So you can actually, in a completely different module, provide code that works with an object. That's something that it didn't know about at all when it was designed. Extremely nice way of structuring code. And, and they figured this out more and more. So when they created the core CLR framework as, uh, as opposed to the full .NET Framework, they've been using this more and more. It wasn't that common when they created PowerShell. Uh, but now we're actually like losing stuff by not having this, since so much of the underlying framework that we're using has this. So that's another uh, thing that we're looking into uh, adding to PowerShell. This is like that you should be able to get them with completions, so that you have your object and then it actually looks at the assemblies that are there and finds the extension methods and make it easy to call them. Today, it's a drag. It, it's, you really have to, you have to know too much and you have to do dance too much of, of a, a syntax dance to, to get there. So, so I'm just showing you this. If, if you really need to go this way, look at this sample, uh, figure out what I did. Best way, wait a year, and I'm sure we'll have it in PowerShell. Not in the Windows, if it isn't deemed important enough to backport. But uh, I guess it's, it won't be. Summary, array input. Do you remember why? To don't call the process method of your advanced functions for every item in the pipeline. Pass the input once, loop through it with a fast for each. You don't have to call it every time you, you, you use your method. When you're just playing around with the command line, the piping is excellent. It's just that it, there are faster ways. And you've seen it a couple of times. If you care about performance on this platform, be prepared. The, th the thing is, the C-sharp code that you had to, to write, 
if you, like I can actually the only things that I would have to have to, to make this as, as easy as possible there are just a few simple This is the minimal version that you would that you would need. And you see the difference between the PowerShell version and the C sharp version of it is non existent. It's really, really small. No. That, uh, that is one of the I've said yesterday that classes are kind of half baked. There are miss, missing pieces. To this. They were they were like primarily designed to support the the DSC scenario, and they ran out of time and engineering resources to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But but to me, the the most important thing for me with having classes in PowerShell is that we have an easy way to create typed output. It works very well with the tab completion and, and the rest of the pipeline and being able to reason about what you have and uh, what kind of data you're using. Uh, I don't use it to create like elaborate frameworks. I have never used inheritance in PowerShell. I think you should avoid inheritance when you can. Composition is almost always a better alternative. As always, I, I don't say never, but think carefully before you do. But, but, but just like, don't be afraid of, of uh, C sharp. If you, if you look like, if you've learned PowerShell is a more complex language in many ways than C sharp. There's a little bit of things you have to learn. Yeah, how do you, do you build it? Steal my project here and modify it and, and, and make it work for you. PowerShell is a very flexible environment, and the really shitty thing with going C sharp in, in PowerShell, if you're using the PowerShell projects, is that every time uh, you, you make a change to your C sharp project, you have to reload the DLL in the process. You have to shut down your process, create a new instance of PowerShell, load your assembly again, because you can't reload the .NET assembly. So it's so much more convenient to iterate uh, in pure PowerShell. But that said, I do write some of my stuff in C Sharp and some of my stuff in PowerShell. But I usually start in PowerShell for convenience. If it's a, a bigger project, I go .NET. If I know I will end up with a lot of data, I go .NET. And you've, you've seen the, the differences in, in, in performance. It's there. This is like PowerShell is dynamic language. You always pay a price for that. I love it, but it's, it's not the fastest. So, so I'm trying just to convey like, I'm not bashing PowerShell. I love it, pun intended. But just it's different different tools. Use what works best. Yeah. If you just know the difference. If you need it, use it. If you don't need it, go ahead. It's more convenient to be in PowerShell. It's faster to write it in .NET. Yes, writing it, it in .NET adds complexity and it adds friction in iterations. Questions? Otherwise, I'll stick around somewhere here if you have have questions. Not that bad. <laughs>